Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, it is an absolute um, honor for us to welcome you to the um, WEO um, at webinar today. Um, Dr. Purnima Bhatt and I are super excited about the panelists. We're super excited about the speakers. Um, there's just so much to, um, you know, so much information to share with you in the, in the short period of time. Uh, we definitely look forward to hearing from you in terms of questions that you may have. So please feel free to use the chat box, use the Q&A box, just type in your questions and we'll try to uh, come to all of them towards the end of the program. So why don't I just, you know, maybe just give a, a brief overview about our um, presentation, uh, the program we have planned for you today. So we are going to be talking about endoscopy in Africa and we will have experience shared from the region um, by experts within the uh, African continent. And our objectives, which you already um, you know, uh, learned about and probably what led you to come in today is to learn about what it takes to set up endoscopy services within the African continent, get an understanding about the prevalence um, and risks of uh, you know, esophageal cancer in Africa, and just learn a little bit more about uh, you know, the differences between intestinal uh, tuberculosis and Crohn's disease. And there'll be so much more information shared, uh, shared today. And you'll also have an opportunity to meet our leadership um, you know, uh, during this webinar. I will now hand over things to um, my uh, partner in crime, so to speak, uh, Dr. Pradeep Babat, who will go ahead and introduce our speakers and panelists for the program. Once again, use the chat box and welcome to everyone who's in attendance. We look forward to having this conversation with you. Thank you. Thanks, Akwe, that's fantastic. It's a chocolate box of goodies for tonight. And our very first speaker is Professor Laj Abokan from uh, Rick's Hospital in Oslo. He's the head of endoscopy there. He's also the co-chair of the Activities for Africa Outreach Committee from World Endoscopy Organization. He shares with us a, a passionate advocacy for endoscopy in Africa, and he's going to be ably helped by Professor um, Haley Michael Desilen from uh, Addis Ababa in St. Paul's Hospital. So thank you very much, Laj. Well, thank you, Pranima, and uh, thank you for uh, having me and uh, allowing me to share some of these uh, uh, thoughts and ideas about <clears throat> how uh, WO can work in this region. <coughs> so just to start off with, uh, with a case which I experienced um, just prior to the pandemic, um, somewhere in Africa, a 36-year-old man with schistosomiasis, uh, recent hematemesis, uh, stabilized at the hospital, but no endosco en endoscope available at the time. So he was discharged and then came back for endoscopy and assessment uh, and hopefully treatment as well. And so uh, endoscopy showed, uh, which is not uh, infrequent, uh, huge esophageal varices with a clear indication for eradication. So in many uh, countries in the world, this would be just taking out your scope, putting on the barrel of bands and go ahead. But in this case, it wasn't like that because this patient hadn't had, he had only paid his way for a upper endoscopy. And so when the issue of uh, variceal ligation came about, he uh, had to get some money and he didn't have any money. So he had to call his friend who had parked outside and he had to come in and uh, get the uh, message, then go to the bank, get the cash, then come back for the patient who could pay. And then subsequently the, uh, the bands were put on. But those bands were not purchased through a uh, sustainable uh, mechanism. They were brought in a ba bag from uh, Egypt and it turned out they didn't really fit the scope. So when we tried to push the uh, barrel against the wall of the esophagus, it just sort of slid in. And so that initial uh, banding uh, really failed altogether until we uh, found a way to avoid this problem. So <clears throat> for me, this uh, single case illustrated a number of the challenges that we uh, see uh, you know, um, visiting uh, places in Africa. So I think this is a, a picture which um, is uh, gen generic to a lot of places, lots of patients, lots of need, but GI endoscopy is certainly underutilized for various good reasons, for sure. Um, some of those are listed here, but those are all you know, relevant reasons why things are not the, the, the way they could have been. And at the same time, there are existing potential resources in the region, a lot of talented the regional doctors, whether they were trained there or elsewhere, fantastic uh, human resources. 
and also quite a number of willing international faculty if they had the mechanism to, to get their services made available for the region. There are donation mechanisms, although um, um, uh, maybe not satisfactory ones. Industry are interested partially to be a part of an emerging market, partially for philanthropic reasons or uh, a wish to, uh, to, uh, to do good beyond the marketing as well. And then uh, the internet is obviously a resource also for this area. But I've been to all these uh, locations in Sub-Saharan Africa. And for me, the picture I see is surprisingly similar. There are differences, of course, but many of the issues are uh, very um, uh, parallel uh, throughout the region. <clears throat> uh, various societies have been, um, uh, at least uh, for periods uh, active, in, um, in Africa, uh, but with a variable sustainability, I would think, but ASG, ESG, the World Gastro Organization, the WEO, and recently the GASA Regional Organization, these have all had activities in the region with, I would say, overlapping ideas, overlapping initiatives, many times the same people, and at some uh, levels, uh, um, uh, discussing, if not fighting for the same, funding. And so my uh, entry into this was through the World Endoscopy Organization. And if you look at the objectives at their website, one of them is to uh, support uh, and in improve endoscopy in underserved areas. <clears throat> so in the past, this was initially just ad hoc initiatives uh, under the umbrella of WO. And then uh, they developed an outreach committee where Africa was just one of many areas where they uh, involved themselves. And so recently, um, at the last World Congress in Rio, uh, Professor Fabi Nomura uh, set up this uh, specific committee to address uh, needs in Africa, where I'm uh, happy to chair together with Professor Kulvinder Dua, who's also here today as a panelist. So I would like to share with you a little bit on how WO is seeing their support model in the region. And uh, the core concept is development of training centers. So we try to identify local or regional issues and specific needs in that area, and then to try to find suitable regional centers, which requires a number of features. We need good people in good positions. We need a strategic location in the country. We need safe access and stable politics so that travel can happen. We need good communications, uh, emails being answered, and once more, good people. And I think that's the core key to success that you're able to connect with and bond with uh, enthusiast um, <clears throat> uh, fellow endoscopists in the area. So based on this, we establish core WO training centers. And the model for this is to initially establish a sort of a prototype center, which we have been working on now for uh, two or three years, where we try to identify the specific needs of that center, which may be different from other centers. We sign a two-way um, memorandum of understanding, and uh, we establish the uh, support needed for that place. And then uh, on a regular basis, we re-evaluate the status and uh, if necessary, revise the activities. But one core thing is not to have sort of one-off events, but rather to try to, to work with a, a sort of um, sustained support with regular contact, regular visits. And then after having acquired experience from one location, we want to try to move that model to other centers, but with modifications because different centers certainly need different um, components of support. So this is our pilot location, uh, the St. Paul Millennium Medical College in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And our good person there, um, among others, uh, is Haile Mikhail Desalen, who uh, has been our main driver in this location. So we tested all our um, models there. So these are the activities uh, which have been put up um, in Addis. So focused uh, regional training courses for three years now uh, with uh, partially training uh, regional doctors, partially faculty upskilling and uh, at least uh, the initiation of train the trainers activities. 
And then in addition to that, reg regular personal visits for, for additional faculty support, quality assessment and hopefully improvements as well within logistics, disinfection, maintenance, inventorying of accessories and documentation. All of these are features which we think should be in place in a sort of certified regional center of the WEO. And finally, we want to initiate and support uh, local initiatives for research. So this is from one of our training courses with hands-on um, training. And uh, we also have didactic uh, talks like this one with uh, Professor Cesare Hassan from, uh, from Milan. <clears throat> Um, so in addition to the activities in the training centers themselves, these are other activities we try to pursue. So getting in touch with other resource people across the world who want to do something in Africa. Uh, we want to try to select, to you know, identify and select good training material. We have uh, liaised with the ESG, which have uh, kindly uh, helped us uh, with some of their uh, learning material as well. We try to facilitate remote training um, and uh, also this webinar as one example, uh, regional research, not just research within the um, training centers, and also try to get up uh, regional networking beyond research too. <clears throat> we want to uh, uh, facilitate uh, donation mechanisms, I'll come back to that a little bit, uh, encourage cross societal collaboration and uh, also if possible impose some political change. Now just a few words on remote training because uh, even though hands-on presence is ideal, it's not always uh, uh, available and certainly not during the pandemic. So uh, other models have been uh, looked at and so even though everybody should have Jerry Way on their shoulder to, to learn colonoscopy, that's obviously also not always available. So uh, what uh, Jerry has been doing is to set up a uh, remote link to a center in Uganda. And uh, he recently published this um, uh, paper with a video to show that this is actually doable, at least if your internet connection is, uh, is uh, sufficient. This is a concern, but obviously this is a model project showing that this is possible. Um, I want to mention research support because research activities bring along with it a lot of other quality improvement uh, activities as well. So what we try is not to come with projects to uh, Africa, but rather to, uh, to tease out uh, research ideas locally and support those. And the support is for, you know, mostly academic, not, not financial, but we also uh, thought that uh, maybe we could sort of create a hub where interested um, uh, fellows could uh, approach the WO at the website and uh, present their project ideas. And then the WO could uh, facilitate connection with um, relevant tutors across the world. And uh, this research part has been spearheaded by uh, Pranima Bhatt, who's uh, sharing this uh, session today. And uh, this is in the um, in, in its uh, infancy, but we hope this can develop further. Um, this is one of our friends from from Addis who uh, who received a um, laptop for his research. And just to mention, one of the projects that we initiated was uh, because we did colonoscopies in very poorly cleansed uh, bowels, and we realized that the bowel cleansing was castor oil in the evening, and then. Uh, enemas in the soap enemas in the morning at the hospital so we uh, have set up a uh, prospective randomized trial where uh, patients uh, instead of this enema received one single dose of a peg prep and uh, then look at the uh, cleansing so this is an example of a very you know low level easy to perform and directly applicable uh, research project and we also set up another one which is a PhD project where we are uh, looking to develop a locally uh, prepared uh, broth uh, for uh, urease uh, testing to replace the current uh, feces antigen test which is a cumbersome modality in in uh, this region so again a very uh, sort of um, uh, locally useful study with directly applicable results or so we hope. 
we also have looked at the documentation support because if documentation could be sort of standardized and uh, collectible, then maybe we could start collecting uh, you know, activity information from our uh, centers. So uh, this is a project we did in, in Addis and also in, in Kenya, where we uh, replaced the, uh, the word template with a uh, sort of automated template with, um, with fields, where we could subsequently uh, collect all the field values from those Word documents into a, an Excel sheet and then automatically uh, have uh, you know activity um, reporting from that system. So that's another example of sort of hands-on locally relevant support. <clears throat> now, as you know, there are issues with scope acquisition, also with disinfection. And uh, although disinfection is taught and the methods in principle are fine, there are a number of corners cut, um, and particularly in the manual cleansing, <clears throat> I would say. Leak testing is uh, rarely done. And the most uh, difficult thing is that uh, scopes breaking or leaking are not sent for repair, as you know, because the whole mechanism and cost of uh, scope repairs is uh, prohibitive for the region. So I, I, I really feel this is a sore thumb of many of these uh, uh, locations, and we still don't have a good solution for this. We try to set up donations, but that's only a sort of a temporary solution, I would say. Uh, and the same goes for accessories, because uh, a lot of people bring you know, accessories in their bag when they arrive, but that's oftentimes not really based on what is needed, but more what was expired in your own office. So to organize that in a better way, and also for the centers to realize what kind of equipment they actually have is, is, uh, is a need. And so this is me trying to make some sense of what was actually uh, available in the uh, corners of the lab in Addis. And so this can be improved. So we are hoping uh, to uh, set up a sort of donation facilitation program where people who have things to donate, but really don't know how to, or can't go through all the hoops and loops of doing it, uh, can uh, approach us and then we will help facilitate the transfer of whatever is available. This all obviously is in the waiting for sustainable purchasing mechanisms, but as you know, this is difficult in many countries. I mentioned cross-societal collaboration. I think this is a very interesting photo from Ghana uh, 10 years ago, where I met really an, at random with um, Louis Roberts from uh, the uh, American Liver Association, Mark Depassian from WGO and ASG, and uh, even our friend from, from uh, Hershey McGarity. So, and we all came there with us like a similar ambition, uh, but independently of each other, not even knowing we were all coming. So it, it goes to show that all these societies have you know, similar ambitions and we should uh, utilize that for collaboration. Uh, we have started a little bit, but for sure that can be improved. And then finally, uh, uh, I think the power of WEO as an international organization may open doors also towards sort of higher level decision, decision makers. Uh, like this lady who is uh, the Minister of Health in, in Ethiopia, and where we, uh, and we met with her last time we were in, um, in Africa together with Bob Bailey and the, uh, the provost uh, of uh, the hospital as well. So um, I think one of the things that makes it fascinating and encouraging to keep going in Africa is the fact that there's so much initiative, so many enthusiasts, so much competence and creativity to find and solve problems. <clears throat> so the plan ahead is to, to expand our training center model into other places uh, after identifying them, to develop a robust network of the relevant endoscopists and nursing in the region, and to connect them with uh, interested um, faculty ab abroad, to expand on the research activities and also to facilitate collaborative multi-center studies if we can, and uh, <clears throat> then to facilitate involvement from international enthusiast experts. So if any one of you is uh, listening to this, please uh, approach us at uh, our website or directly to me on my web uh, or on my email address. So thank you so much 
for listening. Um, actually, I am, um, like I said, many of our activities were located at the, uh, at the center of uh, Haile Mikkel in, in Addis. And I asked him up front if he could comment a little bit on the activities we've been running there and how he sees that, uh, not just uh, seen from, from outside. So Haile Mikkel, are you there? Can you comment a little bit on the activities that we have been trying to set up? Yes, yeah, okay. Thanks so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, can I proceed? Yes. <laughs> okay, yes. thanks so much. Uh, I'm really indebted uh, to the support of the World Endoscopy Organization to our center, St. Paul Hospital. And uh, as has been shown, the burden of, uh, of endoscopy and the requirement is high in Sub-Saharan Africa, including Ethiopia. Because uh, as he has shown, it, esophageal viruses is very high. Patients could die without any support, but we have also an increased burden of cancers, esophageal, colorectal cancer, which occurs even at early age, and many other malignancies. So the W has, so it is a wide support, like it has supported in the political leverage meeting with the uh, experts at, at the Ministry of Health and also our officials. So that, that will help. It's important to know the agenda, whether it is agenda of the Ministry of Health and also the hospital officials. So such repeated uh, communication with them has helped us, has helped us actually, uh, and also to prioritize it uh, as a main, the main uh, uh, support for us. So this will probably help to prioritize uh, endoscopy activities. Malignancies are considered uh, as an important, like fragile cancer, colorectal cancer, which can be treated early if screening programs are there. And as cystosomiasis and patient die with variceal bleeding, which is actually unacceptable, which can be managed with, uh, with easy measures, as we have shown that with easy training, and availability of the bandes. And we have support of uh, WO also uh, to get band uh, in addition to the training and uh, that had been also uh, ongoing support for us. So there was, in addition to that, we have get support from the WO for this data capturing system. This data capturing system can be uh, utilized for other countries as a model. And it's good that it also automatically collects parametric data, and that can help us at least uh, to start, so that we, uh, we can start collaborative studies at least based on those data. And this data capturing system will give us to standardize our needs. And we don't forget the endoscopic inventory, as you have mentioned, and it took a long time for the WO to arrange that. As we have many donation materials, such inventories will help us to easily find what materials uh, do we have and for easy access. Expertise support and teaching was very important for us from WO, including the virtual teaching that you are supporting us in the eco activities, uh, which is running every two weeks. We have got uh, support from WO experts, giving a didactic, a didactic lecture on every you know, on support on the W activities and the support in research. And I don't forget also the support in the cascade guidelines. It should be disseminated widely because this cascade, cascade guidelines that the W has uh, and SG has produced are also based on the resource availability. So those who have starting from limited resources can be used. So the development of the cascade guidelines will also help us, uh, not only us, also to other low income countries and above that. And um, uh, with this, I would like to add something like uh, if in the future, if you get more uh, support, uh, especially to the, uh, to the team as a whole, like as we have said, we have, uh, there's a lack of actually, or there is a need of motivation and dedicated staff in the endoscope unit. So if you have got a dedicated team starting from the nurses that can be supported like by giving uh, either hands-on training or certification in the nursing endoscopy, that will be very important for us. So that will help us to standardize and to motivate the team. So it's not only the physicians, 
we need also to motivate those working in the group, like the training for the nurses, certifying them, motivating them uh, is one important thing. The W has given hands on training, but such certification and um, uh, nursing, I mean, improving their or giving certified nurses for the endoscopy is one thing that we lack as a whole. And the other supporting the, uh, like in the medical engineering, there is no materials we have seen which has failed, endoscopy materials which failed, which are not working, and which incurs a huge cost if you have some training of the biomedical engineers. That's also one important thing that we recommend. So the other thing that I would like to say, the support in the training is in the research activities. So this uh, H. pylori project uh, is very important in-house project. Uh, Hi there, I think we lost you. Uh, it's also a PhD project for one of our signing that, and also the cleansing in the mass of when the scopes. Uh, sorry. Hello? Well, we can hear you just in Hello, hello. Okay, so I was just explaining the support that you get in the research and also this research not only directly to the H. pylori and improving the cleansing enema protocol, which is a traditional one which has been shown. Uh, that will change with additional of pig and uh, additional uh, uh, decreasing the time and improving the enema. We had some difficulties in the last COVID time and uh, the breaking of the scopes and lack of repair, that was a big challenge, but this we had a big support from W and we are indebted to that. And we want to be one of the pilot programs, uh, an exemplary for research sites. If, if there are any questions, I'll, I'm afraid of my internet connections. Might uh, take this opportunity to invite to just introduce our two panelists. That's Professor Haley Makal Deselin from uh, uh, St Paul's Millennium College in uh, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and Professor Kulwinda Dua from the uh, Medical College of Wisconsin, and also co-chair of the World Endoscopy Organization African uh, Activities to Reach Africa Committee. So, welcome to you two both. Uh, I have a question for either of you. I will maybe first to Professor Obokan. Um, you know, you, we've, we've kind of discussed this before. I guess there must be a starting point where uh, an endoscopy centre can, can be taken off on minimum requirements, if you like. Can you make a comment on, on what do you need before or can we help a centre to get to those minimum requirements? Well, you're right. There is a minimum requirement, but I, I will come back to you know, the importance of core people, core quality people like uh, Haile Mikkel, because also I think if you have persons like that, then likely the center around them will also have some level of, of quality and some, you know, some equipment uh, set up so that you have some basis and also at least a, um, a uh, plan for, you know, uh, uh, recruiting more people to that center. So, but that's, you know, obviously one of the things we are looking for when now trying to expand our model to, to, other, to other countries. We've got a couple of questions in the question panel here we'll have a look at. Uh, does your, this first one's about your data capturing system, does it integrate with other systems that are in existence? <clears throat> uh, no, so there are a lot of uh, sort of, uh, um, uh, homemade or uh, sort of privately developed uh, database systems, which are all fine as long as you are in touch with the person who made it. And I've seen a lot of those sitting on computers uh, around. So this system is very r rudimentary in the sense that it is just a template in Word, similar to the template that was already in use. So the uh, logistics were unchanged, but the uh, difference was that the, uh, all the parametric information was instead typed into fields. And so when all these reports are stored in a dedicated folder, then an, uh, an Excel file with a little bit of Visual Basic can extract all that information and list it 
on an Excel sheet. So let's say if you have five centers collaborating, they can just amalgamate those Excel listings and then you have a collected data model. It, it, I thought this seminar was supposed to be in English, but I guess some people understood exactly what you said just then. Uh, another question that we've got here is Helico back to pylori project. Is this just in Africa or all across Ethiopia? Do you have plans for that? Well, let's see. I mean, at the moment, uh, the method is being uh, developed and, uh, and, uh, and um, verified. And uh, actually, I think you may need to know more about this project than me being... I'm wondering what you're going to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> we are starting with Ethiopia because one, one thing we found with this is that this, um, the range in antibiotic sensitivity is quite dramatically different. And part of this comes from the access to antibiotics and legislation around them in these different countries, uh, reflective of how easy it is to just load yourself up with penicillin for every cough and cold. Uh, and for example, in Ethiopia, it's a little bit more strict than other places, you need a prescription, etc. So the antibiotic sensitivities are different. And I think therefore, in terms of what information we get, it should be region specific. But if we can make a cheap broth that works everywhere to culture it up, that would be fantastic. So yes and no, it's local and hopefully it won't be just local. It'll be a nice little uh, export from Ethiopia for everyone that needs it. So that will be, that will be handy and we'll see how Haley Michael and his team come up with that. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? If the participants would like to, please type it in your Q&A field there. Yeah, I have a question. I don't know how are we in time. Probably we are running over. But uh, highly, if you remember, when I came to Ethiopia, we got uh, St. Paul Hospital affiliated with the Medical College of Wisconsin. So we have a mutual uh, affiliation. And one of the ideas was that support services. I mean, endoscopy is not something that mm. works in isolation. I mean, we need uh, cardiothoracic surgeons. We need pathology. We need other services that go hand in hand. And we decided to have telepathology with the Medical College of Wisconsin, if you remember, and oncology consultation. So, so we probably should be looking maybe a little bit outside just endoscopy and see what else is required as support services to run this whole uh, program. Yes, I, I agree with you with Professor Kurinder. So we need to stimulate the, the existing program in the pathology. And they, they, we had a big support in the pathology also from the University of Wisconsin, uh, doing the editing, like the pathology that had been done prior had helped us. So the pathology, the oncology, so it's a multi, uh, a multi departmental uh, approach that should have been, that should have been utilized for this. So we need to use every, uh, uh, multidisciplinary team, including the oncology and the pathology support will help us. That's great. In the interest of time, thank you very much for Haley Michael and thank you very much Professor Abokan for your lovely talk. I'm going to hand over to um, Akwi back now to uh, introduce the next speaker. All right, well, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, this was definitely very enlightening and we do have a lot more questions. And I think if time uh, permits at the end, we would uh, definitely love to get back to this, um, to these questions. There's definitely interest in terms of uh, collaborations, not only setting up the uh, you know, WEO centers, um, but how else individuals and institutions can partner up with um, WEO. So I think we should definitely, you know, hopefully we have time. And if we have to set up another webinar, maybe that's what we'll do. Um, but this is really good. But moving along, I'll uh, introduce one of our next speakers. And, um, you know, this is uh, most, uh, have, uh, you know, probably heard of Dr. Machira given the revolutionary work he's doing with um, esophageal cancer within the African continent. So uh, Dr. Machira is a consultant general surgeon, uh, therapeutic endoscopist, and he's the director of endoscopy department at Tenwick Hospital, Bomet, Kenya. And he's been doing a lot of esophageal cancer related research and clinical and provides clinical care for patients at Tenwick Hospital and the region over the past decade. Um, and he is also a member of the African Esophageal Cancer Consortium. So it is truly an absolute honor um, you know, for us to have uh, Dr. Machira speak to us uh, today. So Dr. Machira, over to you and welcome. Looking forward to, um, to your presentation and learning from you as always. 
Yeah. Uh, thank you, Akwi. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I met uh, Dr. Sambang a few years back, and uh, we have been in touch over the years. So it's a pleasure to be part of these uh, discussions. Um, and the rest of the team here that are all focused on endoscopy in, in not just Africa, but other parts of the world. So it's a really pleasure to be able to share this. So today I'll be giving uh, part one of uh, two talks that are joint, Special uh, Cancer in Eastern Africa, and I'll start us off, and then uh, uh, Prof. Topazian will do the next bit. Um, so as, uh, as uh, Akwe mentioned, um, uh, we, we have been doing some work here in the region, and so this talk will be focusing on um, risk factors, uh, alias phageal disease from endoscopy, uh, a little bit about endoscopy and surgery for phageal cancer, and then feasibility of early detection and screening programs in Africa. And then afterwards, uh, uh, Dr. Topazan will talk a little bit about uh, the, the stent access program. So let me introduce you to the African Special Cancer Consortium. It's actually a group of institutions um, that are best. Uh, so the sites are physically here on the continent and you can see from Ethiopia all the way down Ethiopia, uh, Tanzania, Zambia, South Africa. Recently we had Mozambique join, uh, Rwanda, Uganda. Uh, so there's been a lot of the sites that are doing special cancer research work and clinical care. And we also have some sites that are not on the continent, like the NCI, the National Cancer Institute in the US, IAC in France, um, UCSF in the US. Um, and uh, so all these sites come together and the common uh, linking goal is they're all working on hospital cancer through various um, uh, hospitals and institutions. Now, if you look at the consortium, it's split into three main arms, hospitalogic studies, um, uh, where we have the case control studies, the environmental studies, then we have a lot of work that has been going on to understand the molecular uh, uh, element of vestigial cancer. So there's, we pulled all these sites together and we're doing multi-site uh, GWAS studies and hopefully very soon we'll be able to put together uh, as most of these case control studies are now actually almost complete. Uh, then we have the treatment and palliation arm and here we have all the endoscopy and surgical uh, uh, components. Um, we have the stent access uh, program and then we have uh, an ongoing survival studies and outcomes projects that are going on in the uh, member countries. And then the last bit is advocacy and awareness. And here, essentially, it's really how to engage with the policymakers. And as Prof. Lars mentioned, I think this is one of the key elements um, of keeping things going on, on the continent for special cancer and then looking at funding options and, and being able to, to get this way. So if you look at special cancer in Africa, uh, this is a familiar map. Um, it's a distinct belt uh, along the East Coast. Uh, Called the special cancer belt, um, and the incidence varies across the region, but uh, it's around 20 to 30 per 100,000, and more than 90% are squamous cell carcinomas, as opposed to, uh, you know, in, in Europe where we see adenocarcinoma a lot here, uh, majority of them are squamous cell carcinomas. And it's very interesting that we have quite a large number of patients, almost 20% of cases that are younger, younger than 40 years old. Um, and then there's tremendous genetic diversity, and one of the other elements that uh, we had picked up was that there was uh, not a lot that had been done. And over the last few years, there's been a number of papers that have come out uh, studying special cancer, but there's still a lot of room for research. Why is this important? As you can see here, um, if you look at the age of the rest, the, the, the rest for Africa, look at Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, uh, the incidence and the mortality are almost equal. And so it means uh, as many people as we uh, diagnosing and almost same number is dying. So we really need to be able to work on helping to reduce uh, uh, this, this number so that more, more people can, can uh, live with this disease. And so all these efforts are combined towards achieving that. Uh, what are the challenges facing special cancer care? Uh, as was mentioned, um, some of them include inadequate reporting systems, uh, people who think they might die if they are diagnosed with cancer, and then late diagnosis, many of them come with tumors that are almost occluding, uh, inconsistent referral patterns, um, access to, to chemotherapy and radiation therapy across the region. And then of course, financial constraints. And this is mainly for access to either uh, palliative care with stenting um, and, and the work we've been doing on the stent projects. And then surgery itself is quite expensive, uh, up of around 500,000 Kenya shillings or $5,000 for, for each surgery. And then uh, being able to just go through the various stages of getting care. So finances are actually an important element of care. 
when you look at risk factors uh, in high-risk populations, so this, this slide here is looking at the whole world. Um, what are the risk factors? So the ones that the data has clearly shown um, uh, is, is the low uh, serum selenium. And there's been good data from uh, Europe and other parts where they supplemented the soils and they're able to show uh, a change over time just by supplementing this uh, because then the crops that grow there get uh, the nutrients and then the people eat the crops and then they're able to improve their selenium rates. If you look at a map of Africa, spagel cancer and Africa selenium uh, levels, you can actually see that we, on this continent, there's actually a very good correlation between the serum selenium and the spagel cancer rates. And then non-tobacco, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon exposure, and essentially this is smoke exposure from various sources. Uh, then there's been uh, some papers that have come out from Iran, China, and even in Africa looking at hot food, uh, hot, uh, hot drinks, uh, the tea, coffee, or whichever the drink is, it's really the temperature exposure. And then uh, the other important ones that have been shown, uh, some of the traditional ones, tobacco, alcohol, poor oral health, um, low socioeconomic status has also been shown. And then family history, uh, is another important one. And actually, like here in Tenet, we, we really believe this is a strong uh, contributor to esophageal cancer risk in the region. And then the possible ones that are being explored include opium, uh, contacts with uh, ruminants, you know, for, for populations that have exposure to livestock and have high rates of cancer. Is there a question uh, about this playing a part in the being a risk factor for esophageal cancer? So some of the papers from the region, and actually this, most of these are from Kenya. Diana Menya and her team at uh, one of the AFLEC sites in MTRH, this is not, not uh, from where I am here. They put out uh, from the most recent study looking at dental fluorosis and oral health in the African Esophageal Cancer Corridor. Uh, they also published uh, after that, uh, another paper on hot beverages. Uh, we published a number of papers on tea temperature and uh, there's another one looking at um, this is by Menya et al, traditional and commercial alcohols and esophageal cancer risk. So, so there's been a buildup of work looking at esophageal cancer in the region. Um, if you look at uh, treatment, uh, this is actually historical. Uh, you can see um, a number of authors in the region have looked to describe various things, you know, the component of young cancers. Uh, there's been some describing the patterns uh, and some looking at um, uh, specific age, age groups. So this is ongoing work. And here, this last slide is just looking at the treatment papers uh, across the region. Um, so one of the early ones that I found uh, for postosophagectomy, uh, we've done a number of trials looking at stent uh, palliation for schedule cancer. And there's a review here by Bacol et al. <clears throat> that came out early this year, looking at uh, optimal management of, of schedule cancer in Africa. And it was a systematic review of the different treatment uh, strategies. There was one by the team led by Acqui that was also put out, um, uh, I think late last year, um, that was also, so all of these papers are highlighting the, the, just the, the treatment options that are available in the region uh, for spagel cancer. Uh, we've also done quite a bit of work on palliation. So all these papers uh, look at use of no fluoroscopy uh, for placement of stents. Um, and and uh, I think uh, because uh, Dr. Pazan will be talking a lot about this, I'll just mention this over the years we've, published a number of papers. And right now, most of our stents are placed, actually all of our stents are placed without the use of fluoroscopy. And we've been able to show that it's reproducible, it's easy to do. Uh, we use a measurements technique. Um, and, and so we've been doing stent trainings to be able to improve the access in the region. Uh, looking at the data, you can see here that uh, our numbers have gone up over time. And this is a reflection, one of that we are a referral uh, center here at Tenwek. So many of the patients are being sent and two uh, having the access to the stents and, and three, working on a model that provides these stents at an affordable cost. Uh, but what it also highlights is that there is need uh, because all of these patients are mostly palliative. So there's a lot of work for us to be able to capture patients much earlier and be able to offer them curative options. And so that moves me to the next portion of this uh, discussion, which is early esophageal disease. Um, the focus really is on chromoendoscopy. And, and one of the, uh, the challenges in this region was that many people were coming late. And so um, in around 2008, 2009, a lot of discussions of what can we do to be able to change this narrative. And so there was a lot of uh, paper, papers from you know, China where they were doing chromoendoscopy. And one of the things that the beauty of, of Lugol's chromoendoscopy is that you can actually do it yourself. So instead of buying the commercial Lugol's in the shops, uh, we actually would mix it up in our lab uh, the formula was available, we'd make it up and would, uh, so the Lugol stains, the normal cells, 
uh, but does not stain the abnormal cells because of the glycogen content. And the sensitivity for high-grade dysplasia is very high. So this is an easily uh, affordable technique that can be taught in very many uh, different regions. So we set up a study to do this in asymptomatic adults. So 300 uh, uh, asymptomatic people in our, in our Bomet County, which is a high-risk area for sphagial cancer, they all got an endoscopy procedure with staining. Uh, we biopsied uh, the unstained areas and we were able to actually determine a prevalence rate. So you can see here from the findings, uh, the overall dysplasia rate was 14.4%, but the more important one was the high-grade dysplasia where we combined the moderate and severe, which was 2.9%. And so practically speaking, uh, that means um, for every 100 people, only three uh, we got with dysplasia. So this raised some questions about the, the, the feasibility of this, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But what it did show is that um, age was an important uh, uh, variable. We also discovered that the area that you lived in, so this was in reference um, to, to the zone. So we had three zones. If you looked at the map I showed earlier, one was um, fertile area, one was mixed, and one was dry. And so if those who came from uh, the mixed, uh, the fertile area had more dysplasia. And then the other thing we saw was alcohol uh, intake, which we knew. Uh, as one of the established risk factors was actually important for dysplasia. These other variables were not uh, statistically significant, and so we, we left them out. Um, one of the other things that came out from this dysplasia study, uh, which we published actually this year, uh, we looked at um, indoor wood combustion, so ex exposure to carbon content in this asymptomatic uh, cohort of people. And what we did find was that um, uh, if you look at the red uh, bars, these are, this is the 10 week data. And uh, the, the, these different colors here are comparing the US data from the NN study, the MATCH study, and the Golestan study. And what we found was that 2.4, 28.1 times higher uh, in the Kenyan never tobacco users compared to the other population. So we do know that there's a significant carbon exposure component. And, and these were asymptomatic people that we were measuring. And so uh, in terms of location where they were living, we found that if you had um, the cooking area inside the main living area, and then that exposed them to a lot of smoke. And then the next one that was important was living, uh, cooking in a separate room in the same house. And then the last one was cooking in a separate room outside the house. And the ones with the least exposure were the ones who would cook outside in the oven. So we do know that there is some significant component uh, of, of Spagial cancer being driven just by exposure to, to carbonic um, uh, sources. So here we have pictures showing the typical, you know, this is a kitchen and you can see the smoke charred walls. And this is over time. So, so many of the cooking areas look like that. So in summary, we found that uh, pH metabolite concentrations in Bomet were very high. A younger age, female gender, low education and indoor cooking were determinants of high polycyclic aromatic uh, hydrocarbon co concentrations. And we also found that, uh, so this pH biomarker concentration was associated with advanced spagial squamous dysplasia, even though we had a small number of uh, patients with dysplasia. So this raises questions about uh, uh, this pathway and whether there, there's actually room now for more studies in spagial cancer risk factors where we can talk about clean cooking and you know chimneys and windows and things to reduce carbon exposure. And there's also opportunities for collaboration in that by looking at this same risk factors in established sphagial cancer. And then the other exciting element has been, uh, so there's been data from uh, the team in the UK and in the US, uh, Prasad Aya and uh, Rebecca Fitzgerald looking at sponge studies. Uh, and uh, recently uh, we were seeing them share this work, uh, the team at UC in, in the UK. And so even in Africa, we've been thinking about this. So there's ongoing studies looking at um, the use of uh, sponges for screening. Uh, so this would allow us to be able to do community-based screening. You know, you could go out and they could swallow this um, the sponge, pull it up. And so right now we are actually in the process of carrying out these studies and we want to see whether we will find uh, data that will also be useful in a super muscle carcinoma setting. Uh, and I think this, this and other, you know, like the urea test and breath markers uh, might be interesting uh, tests to be used for, for non-invasive screening for spagial cancer. And then briefly, the role of endoscopy in uh, surgery for sphagial cancer. Um, so I like putting up this slide because it highlights how far we've come. Uh, one of the early patients that was resected, he got a tube connecting his upper portion of the esophagus to the stomach. They did a spagectomy and uh, he actually refused to go back for a completion surgery. So he lived with this tube for 13 years. But if you look at where we've come from, 
And what we do now, the, the, there's been evolution in the, in the surgical approaches. And so endoscopy is one of the key elements uh, for, for assessment of these patients. We do initial evaluation, we find the tumor length, we look at uh, the characteristics, and then they go through the rest. And so for us in Tenet, we've developed our own uh, locally adapted uh, version. So we do a performance status assessment, we watch them walk. Uh, one of them is an eyeball test. We do a stairs stress test. This is in lieu of a pulmonary function test. So in short, we make them go up and down a flight of stairs. And, and if, if they can't do it, you know, of course, that they might have a difficult post-op. Then we do image evaluation, a CT scan, uh, ultrasounds, chest x-rays. In the past, we could only do ultrasounds. Now we have PET scans available. So this has changed. And then you talk with the patient. This is actually one of the key things uh, to prepare them for what's coming ahead. You know, they, going to be a few days in the hospital, an ICU stay, and then we do a thorough pre-op assessment. And then finally, we decide uh, which type, three field, two field, three stage, uh, minimal invasive, do you want to do some bits laparoscopic or is it all open? And, and once you do that, then you set them up. So we published this paper uh, a few years back. Um, we were looking at patients who had uh, HIV and, uh, and we did a sophagectomy in them. What we did find was that there was no difference between those who had HIV and those who did not have. And so Right now, as long as they are uh, on treatment and they're doing well, they're actually very good candidates. And you can see here our current indications for surgery, uh, absence of metastatic disease. We look at albumin, BMI, age. This is now relative. We actually decide based on how they look. And the endoscopy part is you not know, tumor length more than less than 10 centimeters. And then if you put in a stent, uh, our internal rule here is to be within uh, two months or eight months. And so that uh, takes me to stents as a bridge to surgery. Um, this patient here uh, for sure was not a surgical candidate. Uh, we put in a stent and you can see the difference in four weeks of nutrition and they come back for assessment and uh, they get a, a procedure done. This is a tumor and you can see the metallic stent uh, in there. So at the time of resection. So we've, we've actually been able to, we have now have a series of patients who've benefited from this. So we think that the other role that endoscopy plays uh, through stenting is to, to help us uh, move these patients from being unresectable to resectable. And even if it's a small number, it's making a difference for each of those patients that they're able to access uh, surgical care through this. Uh, uh, this. Um, um, so as I finish, uh, screening and early detection in Africa. So what does this mean? Uh, we've talked about this. For, so from inception to reality, uh, some of the challenges uh, which Prof. Lars mentioned at the beginning, you know, facilities that can carry out endoscopic procedures. Uh, we've just finished a, a paper that was looking at endoscopic capacity survey in four countries. And, uh, and one of the key things that we did find out was actually the location of endoscopy sites. And, and, and like in Kenya, most of them are in the urban areas and some, some of them are in the rural areas. And those who can offer diagnostic are different from those who can offer therapeutic and those who can offer a more advanced endoscopy. So, uh, being able to offer endoscopy services in public facilities would be key. And then having functioning equipment, as has been mentioned, the repair costs, you know, uh, sometimes you have to work with equipment that are really, really old, so they cannot even be serviced anymore. And then having um, the access to different levels of care for endoscopy. And then public education, so being able to allow people to come in for, you know, screening, uh, even if it's for colorectal cancer, they know that they can get in an endoscopy, a colonoscopy procedure for special cancer that if we diagnose it, they will not die, that we will help them. And this stigma has been one we've fought for a long time. And then spreading information on risk factors. Um, some people hide the illness because of the fear of the unknown. So helping them to come out. And so here we use those who survived, you know, they've gone through the process, they now come to clinic for follow-up. And we have them talk to those we've diagnosed in the endoscopy unit to encourage them that it is possible to have surgery and go through it and actually have a normal a productive life. I think our oldest is now 13 years out. She's had multiple children. Um, and so she comes here to say hi every year. And then acceptance of, you know, that the endoscopy procedure is safe, uh, that it can be done and that there are no the minimal uh, risks. The risks are there, but in well, high good volume centers, you can do them well. And then endoscopy training. Uh, so short-term versus longer-term trainings, you know, two weeks for workshops, or, you know, specialized workshops, and then longer trainings and fellowships. Um, in, in embedding the endoscopy in the specialty training, like now we are doing for the surgery training here, the residents rotate for two months with us. Advanced endoscopy training through collaborations across sites in Africa and also in other parts of the world. Uh, training for nurses and techs, I think uh, Haile mentioned this in some of his talks. Uh, and then being able to use some of the equipment, like here we, we have some of these tools available and we use pig intestines, 
uh, to do practice sessions. And then integrating with primary healthcare. So as, as uh, Prof. Lass talked about, integrating, talking to the Ministry of Health so that they can be able to put these um, systems into play. And then the cost, I think this is really important. Uh, for If we're able to do this at large scale, then they have to be funded centrally. But for now, we're having to make do with a mix of models, uh, you know, donations, uh, partnerships, sometimes you purchase. And then the role of the national health insurance is in the different countries that if they're able to say, okay, fine, if we get, if you have a confirmed relative with a sphagial cancer, then we focus on screening the first degree relatives and the national health insurance paying for those relatives to get a screening endoscopy. That's one way of doing this. And then treatment options, where do we do this? You know, endoscopic treatment, surgical treatment, you know, the mucosal resections, um, uh, radio frequency ablation. Right now, they're not ubiquitous in the region, but this is what the future is looking like. And, and when we move from being able to do just diagnostics to being able to offer uh, uh, whatever care is required for these people. So then regional centers of excellence and training is the final one uh, where we, as, uh, as has been mentioned, uh, through the WO training centers, WGO and other uh, organizations that have been working to improve capacity in the region and having centers of excellence. So if say here in China, we do a lot of esophageal cancer work then it may make, make, make sense to have uh, uh, esophageal cancer treatment site based here. So uh, as I finish, what are the next steps in Africa? So are screening programs possible in Kenya and in Africa? I think we would need to focus in areas of high risk areas. So, if you look at that map, Malawi, Kenya, Ethiopia, Zambia, the areas that have high risk is where we focus the efforts. Doing community outreach programs, you know, having a team of endoscopists, pathologists, community workers that can all integrate this. Then having good quality endoscopy. For now, it's legal school endoscopy, so training people in these techniques. We've been doing this in multiple sites now in different countries. And then biopsy orientation, this is the pathological site. And then I think this last three parts, being able to follow up and recall these patients is actually key because now that everyone has a mobile phone and, and it's available in all parts of Africa, this is a really important task. And then being able to refer them to centers where they can get treatment. You know, if it's early disease, that they can have therapy offered to them and then or surgical resection that they can go to the sites. And I think finally, uh, being able to have multiple sites doing endoscopy and then developing a good and endoscopic primary screening test, whether it's the sponges, or a blood-based test, uh, all of these things might actually be a game changer for us in this part of the world. So to reduce the cancer burden, I think um, a combination of all these things, reduce exposure by education, um, uh, then perform case control studies to understand any new modifiable risk factors, uh, looking at the genetics to understand the biology so we can risk certify and develop new strategies, and then develop clinical useful screen tests. And then um, as uh, Prof. Pazan will talk about expanding the access to palliative care in high risk areas. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to share this. Um, it's been a <laughs> few minutes of discussion, but happy to share what we've been doing here um, on the early detection side um, and surgical treatment uh, as we all will focus on uh, treating as fragile cancer in this part of, of the world. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for that, uh, Mike. Um, so we have, um... We have several questions in the chat. One was already answered, but I'm just gonna you know, pick three questions. Um, and so one of the questions, just a simple, you know, what do you mean by the eyeball test, um, which you mentioned? Mm -hmm. um, then the other question was, you know, once you diagnose uh, dysplasia endoscopically, what kind of endoscopic treatments are currently available for patients? Um, and then the Last question before we move on to the next uh, speaker is, is the incidence of esophageal cancer going up or down, you know, as in countries are getting richer, improved lifestyle, is that reducing um, the uh, level of uh, malignancy, the mm -hmm. incidence of malignancy? Okay. Uh, thank you for those questions. I think I'll start with the first on the eyeball test. So the eyeball test is uh, when they come into clinic, um, it's, it's, so we, we look at them and we assess. You can actually tell nutritional status by you know, sunken cheekbones. Um, there, there are certain markers that tell you, give you clues. So that's part of the eyeball test. And once we do that, they now get a formal BMI assessment. So you actually cross check and they do a height weight and we chart that. We also do a performance score now, uh, which is added to their records. But we've found that, um, and this is something that, that's why we put it there, that when you look at the patients when they come into the clinic, you can tell um, a lot from how they look and their nutrition, frailty, frailty actually, that's what I was trying to allude to. 
that how will they sustain the surgery? And, and, and this is one of the things I learned from uh, one of my mentors, because sometimes we'd say, I think this patient, everything looks great. It's a short tumor. There's, um, it looks doable, but they don't look, something about them isn't quite right. And usually we would find when you open up, that the tumor is much more advanced than we thought. Um, so the eyeball test is part of what we do, but now we are a bit more objective in what to do by adding subsequent markers to support. Uh, so it's same with the test, test, we, we make them walk up and down or walk the corridors around the clinic, see how easily they get out of breath uh, in lieu of having all the proper gadgets available. So these are all uh, a 10 uh, adaptation to being able to do what we can to help us decide who's a fit candidate for surgery. Uh, so one of these days, we we hopefully be able to put up a model that can combine all of this and see what how that actually measures to uh, uh, the standard ways of assessing patients. Um, the other question, let me see here, was um, uh, about the dysplasia. The dysplasia oh, yeah. question, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for treatment of, of dysplasia, we we did uh, for those we found with dysplasia, we offered them therapy here. So we did a combination of EMR. And we got some funding and support uh, to do RFA for a select number of patients. Um, so in combination of those two, um, that is what is available. I think for now, the practical reality is if they do not get um, endoscopic treatment, which for now is fairly, fairly limited to mucosal resections because the RFA project, the generator and the cost of each of those um, balloons is, uh, and, and the applicator device is quite high. Uh, then they, they get offered surgery. So if, if they have carcinoma in situ or it's 50-50, you follow them up, do legal staining, and then decide, okay, fine, we cannot offer endoscopic treatment, but we can offer you surgical treatment. So I think one of the areas for partnership, even with WEO, is as we do this, is how do we make this available in the region? So there's, uh, and then the last bit would be, you need enough numbers to sustain this. Um, so, so as we do this, are we able to get enough people to, regularly start doing this so that it's become standard uh, therapy. So for now, um, most patients are getting surgical resections here at our institution. We are able to do uh, mucosal resections for small lesions. We can't do uh, ESD yet um, uh, at the moment. It's not available and we have not done any RFA cases for a number of years now. Um, what was the other question? And the final was about the incidents. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so I think the incidence is a reflection of a number of things. One, uh, so we set up uh, national cancer registries. I think all over Africa, AOTIC, which is the African Organization for Research and Training in Cancer, has been uh, doing a lot of work to build capacity for cancer registries. So in Kenya, we now have um, hospital-based registries that are feeding to the national and population-based registries. So for us, our numbers look like they're increasing, but actually it's a reflection that we are now capturing more data. I think in the past, we may not have been capturing enough to have a true reflection. But I also think that um, there's still an element that there's a change in lifestyle that is uh, affecting, you know, um, like we are now seeing more adenocarcinomas in some parts of the country, like in, in the capital cities, they're reporting more adenocarcinomas opposed to square muscles. So we know there's an element of lifestyle and obesity and reflux that is beginning to also play a role. But all of this is still anecdotal. Uh, but um, I think the key thing is that we are now capturing more patients who are this fragile cancer compared to the past. Yeah. Any other questions? I think Mark answered the one on HPV. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, right. I, I'll right. stop there. We might move on in the interests of time. Uh, fascinating talks as usual. Fantastic. That's great work. Um, our last speaker for this evening or this morning, wherever you are in the world, uh, is uh, Professor Dion Levine from South Africa. He's a medical gastroenterologist uh, at the Gastrointestinal Clinic in Grutschu Hospital and University of Cape Town uh, in Cape Town, South Africa. And today he's going to be helping us differentiate that old chestnut, the difference between tuberculosis and Crohn's disease. Are you there, Professor Levin? Um, 
Actually, before I go on, I've just been, so I'm sorry, I'm a bit confused as to whether Professor Topazian was going to talk now or later, but if Professor Topazian is ready, um, Mark, are you there? Yeah, thanks. We're running quite far behind, Pernima. Maybe we should just omit my part and move on to Prof. Levin if he's... All right. If, Is that okay with you? I, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, let, let's try to do that. I'm just worried about the time. Thanks, Mark. We'll get you back for another talk, I think. Is, if Professor Levin is there. Hmm. He's muted for one thing. Yeah, if you're, if you're trying to speak, Professor Levin, you're muted at the moment. Okay. Um, okay, Mark, maybe you can start and we'll see if we can, we can contact Professor Levin. Let's do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I guess I'll start my video here and try and share my screen. And what I'm gonna do is skip most of my talk because it's duplicative of a lot that Michael has already told you. And Mike, that was an excellent presentation. And I'm just gonna tell you about the AFRIC Stent Access Initiative, which um, Mike already introduced to you the idea of the African Esophageal Cancer Consortium who's involved and what countries are participating. When esophageal stenting was first introduced into Kenya 25 years ago, I brought the stents in my suitcase, like, like Lars was talking about bringing endoscopy accessories in his suitcase. And that's fine, but it's not a sustainable or scalable approach to meeting the needs of a region. And so I want, I'm gonna tell you about this uh, uh, formal and programmatic approach to trying to make esophageal stents available throughout Eastern Africa to the patients that need them. And this is um, an example of what can be done and what can be accomplished uh, with effort. And this is what, what I'm going to present to you is very much a team effort. And I'm presenting images from Beatrice Mushi's paper that described what our AFREC team did with this. And I thank Beatrice for writing this up and for the, the um, privilege of presenting it to you. So we, AFREC took seven um, steps in trying to make stents, of, uh, affordable stents accessible widely. And I'm gonna go through each of them briefly with you. Um, if I can get my slides to advance. So the first was to identify barriers to stent access to patients throughout Eastern Africa. And so we did a, a survey of centers in the region to find out what are the barriers. And this table shows them all, and I'm not gonna read them all. I'm showing this mainly to tell you that we didn't try and actually address all the barriers. We looked at mainly the ones in the red arrows here. We found there were, for the patients, the stents were had a prohibitive cost. For the hospitals, the availability of devices was dependent on donations or ad hoc procurement. It wasn't sustainable. And there were a limited number of trained endoscopists who could even deploy a, a stent effectively and safely. And then at the system level, again, the price uh, of a stent available from a verified manufacturer was prohibitive and there was lack of transparency and reliability in procurement systems. So we thought we could take on those elements of the barriers to stent access. We then analyzed market demand, and we did that by looking at the best estimates of esophageal cancer incidence in the region and multiplying by the population, but then subtracting from that number, the number of patients who might get other therapies such as surgery or radiotherapy, and, and more importantly, the number of patients who simply would not seek care, which is quite a large number, we believe. And so we ended up with what we thought was a realistic assessment of the approximate number of patients in the region who would need uh, or, or choose to have a stent in, on a yearly basis. We then did a global uh, competitive bidding process asking esophageal stent manufacturers to make bids uh, for providing stents sustainably in Eastern Africa. 
And there was a surprising amount of interest. Stent manufacturers from North America, Europe, and from a number of sites in Asia all participated in this bidding process. And the ultimate winner of the process was Boston Scientific Corporation, which has committed to making esophageal stents available throughout the region at a cost of 100 US dollars per stent. And uh, you know, depending on where your perspective, that either sounds very cheap or still very expensive. Um, but the fact of the matter is that in most of the settings where AFREC is working, most patients and their families can between them may uh, decide to purchase a stent for that price. Not all families, not all patients, certainly, but it makes stents uh, affordable and within reach for a large number of patients. And you might say, well, shouldn't they get stents for free? And um, I would say, sure, that would be great. But to make something sustainable, it's very difficult to come up with a sustainable model that's free. We then established processes for actually getting stents available to patients once we had an industry partner. And this image it shows the complexity of what's involved in trying to make stents actually available to patients and to solve the dual issues of access and training. So on the right, you have the two international partners, AFREC and Boston Scientific Corporation. The next column is the five countries that are currently participating in this stent access initiative in Eastern Africa. And these countries, their regulatory requirements vary considerably. Some of them, it's very easy to import stents. There's, there's little regulatory burden. Others, it's quite difficult and cumbersome to get approval to import a stent. And so a lot of variation country to country. The next column, in each country, we have one institution, which is the champion institution for this initiative. So the institution has taken on the role of being the lead in their country to establish the program at their institution to be a training site in their uh, country. And then over on the far side, we have multiple hospitals within each country. And our goal is to see stents being placed actually at multiple hospitals with the endoscopists from these uh, spoke hospitals getting trained at the national champion site at the national hub. So this is sort of a, this is a surprisingly complex process getting from an agreement with an international partner to provide the stents to actually being able to have the stents available to patients. And in different countries, this process is at different stages, uh, but in all, I think in all these countries now, patients are receiving stents. The next step was to, uh, which actually happened simultaneously with some of these other steps was to develop an endoscopic training program. And fortunately the folks at Tenwick have for years been training endoscopists in how to place esophageal stents without fluoroscopy. Sea arms are, are hard to come by in Eastern Africa. So you need a method that doesn't require radiology if you're gonna put stents in lots of people. So uh, there, was a, there was a defined curriculum and endoscopists come from uh, to, to a site, a training site, typically one of those champion hospitals I mentioned typically spend a week there, Monday through Friday. There's daily didactic and interactive sessions. There's also quite a bit of hands-on training. And the goal is that each of the participants will place sufficient stents themselves that by the end of the week, they are competent to do this on their own. And we have a formal assessment, uh, adopts form, directly observed procedural assessment form for esophageal stent play, uh, uh, management and stent placement. And uh, we fill out one of those forms after each procedure, discuss with the trainees and uh, talk about things to do differently with the next procedure. And if we're fortunate during the week, some adverse events happen. And I say that because we want our trainees to know what to do. So if the stent deploys too proximal or too distal, or it doesn't expand properly or something else happens, or even if, their strider after placement of a stent. We want, we give lectures about this, but we love it when our trainees uh, get hands-on experience and how to take care of an adverse event in real time. And finally, 
we get we we make links when the team comes with the inst- hosting institution. You know, we meet the CEO of the hospital and we talk about how to strengthen partnerships in this work. Uh, we've created a device registry. So each patient that gets a stent, there's a device registry uh, form that's filled out and posted to an online database. So we're collecting data and we established accountability, much like Lars presented about WEO and picking sites. We have criteria for picking sites for this initiative. They have to be sites with access to a large number of esophageal cancer patients. They have to have a sustainable endoscopy practice and endoscopists who are already skilled at diagnostic endoscopy um, and are are willing to commit not only to learning uh, how to place esophageal stents, but to being prepared to train other colleagues in the future. And then, as I said, we're collecting data about the the, uh, performance of our trainees and even collecting data about how they're they're, when they, once they go out and do this on their own, what the 30 day outcomes are for their, our trainees patients. Cause we would like to know, um, are we, are we really helping patients with this initiative? So to summarize, um, accessing affordable esophageal stents in a low resource setting. So, first of all, stents are appropriate technology. I didn't show you data on that, but Mike showed you some. Uh, a programmatic approach is required. And um, once uh, development of an endoscopic technology or modality has reached a sufficient level in a region, it's time to shift from donations to a programmatic and sustainable approach. Device companies are, we found, are very interested in partnership. And I think this is fantastic and highly laudable. And we should uh, um, encourage and applaud them for this. And regulatory approvals, endoscopist training, and accountability are key. So thank you, uh, Purnima, for the chance to present a little bit of this work. Oh, it's fantastic. I um, find this so fascinating. And I love the fact that it is, it's quite inspiring. Being able to get a bunch of people together and get something done is, is just cool. And I think that um, given that Acri and I have been scribbling viciously behind the lines to try to get a setting up endoscopy in Africa session and new webinar. This is going to be at least one of the talks, I think. So we look very much forward to hearing all of the details of that next time, Mark. I'm going to skip the section on questions here. And we found um, Professor Levin. Thank you for joining us, Dion. Um, just to repeat again, he's a medical gastroenterologist at Group Shure Hospital and University of Cape Town in South Africa. And he's going to be talking to us about the difference between intestinal tuberculosis and Crohn's disease, a vexing question. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm not a professor, but thanks for the introduction. Um, <laughs> I just want to thank Chris Cassianides for asking me to speak. He um, He's head of a, something called the South African Gastroenterology Foundation, which is an educational foundation in South Africa. I'm Dion Levine. I work as a clinical gastroenterologist at a hospital in Cape Town. It's affiliated to the University of Cape Town. And I've been asked to speak about differentiating ITB from Crohn's disease. I don't present any of my own data on this, but I do present some of my colleagues' data who have published on this locally. So just by way of a case that we've all seen before, 20-year-old female, call center operator, right ILEC, fossa pain for nine months, some weight loss, a little bit of loose stools, no fever or night sweats, no previous TB or recent TB contacts, no extra intestinal symptoms, no perianal problems, and the in, in, uh, specific EIMs would be uveitis, arthritis, a rash, no family history of inflammatory bowel disease or any other cancers. On examination, a bit tend in the right iliac fossa region, as we've all seen cases before like this, and the blood profile, I draw your attention to the fact that the patient is HIV negative, a microcytic anemia with a touch of the old iron deficiency that's probably an acute phase response, as is the slightly low albumin and an elevated CRP. This is a coronal CT abdomen showing some enhancement and thickening in the right iliac fossa, looking quite nasty. 
This is a, the axial CT scan showing a similar thing, uh, thickening and hyper-enhancement in the right iliac fossa, probably terminal ileum slash cecum. And this is the endoscopy. This is the cecal pole. Somewhere in here is the ileocecal valve, which is kind of gone. That's the opening there. You've got these large transverse ulcers. Maybe that's a mucosal island or a pseudopolyp, and there seems to be a lot of destruction. So why don't we just get on with treatment for Crohn's disease? Obviously, for the purposes of this talk, we're not looking at a thousand other differential diagnoses, given that it's TB or Crohn's disease. But there's a problem in South Africa, which many of you may know, or some of you might not. In general, there are 10 million people sick with TB in 2019 in the world, of which 25% of these patients are in, on the African continent, and about 3.5% are in South Africa. And these are the um, references for those who are interested. The incidence of TB in Africa is thought to be about 230 per 100,000 population. The incidence of TB in South Africa, and particularly where I live in Cape Town, is in the region of 600 per 100,000 population. And if you compare that to a high income country, you can see that it's an unbelievable difference. 10 new cases per 100 in most high income countries. And there we are at the bottom of the, of the African continent. And we are a slightly bigger dot than that dot. And we are between 100 and 500,000 incident TB cases in 2019. So a major problem. Interestingly enough, I came across a recent publication in a local journal just to set the scene for the problems that we're dealing with. The Eastern Cape is one of the provinces in South Africa. I live here. It's a tertiary hospital where they looked at people over 18, fully conscious and clinically stable who presented for care to the emergency room. And it was care for whatever reason. It may have been shortness of breath. It may have been a sore toe. But over a six week period of the 790 people attending the ER, 121 of them or 15% were TB positive, either active TB made at the diagnosis or came with a diagnosis of TB or were diagnosed with TB shortly thereafter, of which 50% were HIV positive. So just to show you the degree of problem we have in this country. And needless to say, South Africa has one of the highest global burden of HIV, TB co-infection in the world, possibly even the highest, I'm not sure. 300,000 cases of TB and 177 new HIV positive TB cases um, in 2018. Now, abdominal TB, and this is not intestinal TB, but this is extra pulmonary TB, account for about 11 to 16% of extra pulmonary TB in general populations. And if you look at the US, gastrointestinal TB make up 2.5% of extra pulmonary cases. I'm not aware of data in our country, but um, it's probably more here. And extra pulmonary TB is more common in patients with HIV. What about inflammatory bowel disease in South Africa? Well, in a publication in our local journal about eight years ago, 12% of IBD patients in Cape Town, this is not representative of South Africa, but of Cape Town or the Western Cape where I live, had TB either before or after the diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease. This is UC and Crohn's. In a more recent abstract that hasn't been published, where they looked at 1,000 patients, roughly the same Crohn's to UC ratio, 4% or 1 in 25 patients had active TB diagnosed after the diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease, and about 20% of the cohort who were tested had latent TB positive activity. And 8% had TB before or after the diagnosis in this cohort. And if we look at inflammatory bowel disease in South Africa, again, this is data from the Western Cape, we're seeing about 120 new patients per year. And this is data from a colleague who runs a, a, something called the IBD Africa Registry. And it goes back about 60 years. And as you see, there's been an increasing diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease in Cape Town. And basically what it's mirroring is well-known evidence that as, you, as countries go from developing into developed and as the countries become more industrialized, there's an increase in inflammatory bowel disease with ulcerative colitis usually preceding the diagnosis of Crohn's disease by about 10 years. So we're following a pattern that's been well recognized. 
So how do you differentiate ITB from Crohn's? Because obviously the algorithm of treatment is very different. You know, a touch of steroids for, for TB is not really the treatment. So in our toolbox, we've got a clinical, we've got serological, we've got endoscopic imaging and histo slash microbiology, which I'll keep as a group. So let's look at clinical. The problem with ITB and Crohn's disease is both have similar constitutional symptoms, anorexia, weight loss, fever. The gastrointestinal symptoms can be, can be similar because of the nature of the pathology. Mucosal ulceration can re result in diarrhea, bloody stool, and transmural inflammation can result in fistulization or obstruction. The extraintestinal manifestations can be similar. You can have perianal disease, you can have arthritis, uveitis, etc. A family history of IBD is not that common, but it may point you in one direction, as well as a TB contact history, which is not always available. At the bedside, it's very difficult to differentiate the two. TB can mimic the extraintestinal features of Crohn's. You can have direct involvement of the joint, skin, and eyes, and we're talking about erythema nodosum or induratum. And immune-mediated phenomena can also occur with TB of joint, skin, and eyes. Now, perianal disease has always been thought to be one of the features of Crohn's disease, either abscess or fistula. But in a study done in, uh, in, 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 at our hospital a number of years ago, where they looked at non-caseating granulomatous positive patients with TB and, and non-caseating granulomatous positive patients with Crohn's disease, the patients who had peri isolated perianal disease all happened to have TB. And in a study published over a decade ago, looking at about 100 patients with perianal disease at our institution, about 7.8% of, of perianal disease were tuberculous. Thrombosis can be a hallmark of both pathologies. And just to look at some of the clinical issues, the general feeling is that the duration of Crohn's disease is longer than the duration of TB in terms of history that night sweats are more common in TB and ascites. Extraintestinal manifestations we've touched on in a study that I mentioned with the 68 patients with non caseated granulomas compared to Crohn's patients with non caseated granulomas, erythema nodosum and uveitis were exclusively found in the Crohn's disease group, but this may not necessarily be the case. So these are just some, some interesting diff uh, uh, possible differentiators. In the study as well that I mentioned, there was a far lower albumin in the TB patients, 37 in Crohn's versus 22 grams per liter, which may help you. And patients who are obviously HIV positive would fall into a higher probability of TB. But other than this, routine blood tests are not particularly helpful, if at all. Chest x-ray, would that helpful? Well, obviously, if there's TB on the, t on the chest x-ray, then that clinches the diagnosis. But in fact, fewer than 50% of patients with intestinal TB uh, will have an abnormal chest X-ray and even less than that, in 33% in the case that, uh, that, I, that, I've chatted, um, that was presented uh, in, this, in this journal. What about serology? Well, the anti-saccharomyces uh, antibody is a mark of intestinal permeability. It's an antibody to food antigen and it doesn't help differentiate TB from Crohn's disease. It can be positive or negative in both. What about specific TB tests like interferon gamma assays, the IGRA tests? The problem is these are tests of memory cells. They're not good in active disease. They can be up to 30% negative tests despite documented active TB. It can be indeterminate in 5% and it can actually peri periodically normalize. So it's not a particularly good test to differentiate between the two. Neither is the tuberculin skin test, which is a test of memory T cells. So it can be latent, active, treated, clear, et cetera. The point is the same. What about a urine LAM, which is a test of the mycobacterial wall cell, uh, cell wall lipoglycan. It's present in the urine of TB infected individuals and it's best performed in quite advanced HIV positive patients. Well, there's no data for intestinal TB, but we do use it occasionally. And then I came across something called T regulatory cells, which are upregulated intestinal TB. I don't know much about this. Just a word on this. What about endoscopy? Most TB affects the ileocecum. 
Maybe that's related to the fact that there's lymphoid tissue in abundance there. Maybe there's slower transit or perhaps there's low bile salt. No one quite knows. But the problem is that 20% of patients can have a segmental colitis without ileocecal involvement, and that can look like Crohn's. 44% of patients can have skip lesions, and about 5% of patients can have a pancolitis with tuberculosis. And in this study published in the SAMJ that I've mentioned already on numerous occasions, isolated colonic disease had an odds ratio of six to favor tuberculosis. One of the professors who started the GI clinic in the early 1950s said that Crohn's disease bites the ileum and licks the cecum, and TB bites the cecum and licks the ileum. So let's look at some endoscopic features about biting the cecum and licking the ileum. There is some data to suggest that longitudinal ulcers are more in keeping with Crohn's, with normal surrounding tissue, and that circumferentially orientated ulcers or transverse ulcers are more in keeping with TB. And this, this crowd published something in 2017 where they tried to validate a pre-existing score that was published about 10 years prior to this. And just taking you through this, there's a Crohn's disease, longitudinal ulcers, aphthous ulcers, a, co a cobblestone appearance, and lesions in the anorectum were more suggestive of endoscopic features of Crohn's disease versus transverse ulcers, destruction of the ileocecal area, and a patulous IC valve, and less than four segment involvement, which would indicate perhaps tuberculosis endoscopically if you were inclined to try and make a, make a, a decision. And they, just to highlight that they looked at the anorectal lesions, longitudinal, et cetera, things that I looked at, small study, but there seems to be some evidence that you may be able to predict or certainly pretend to. I don't find this particularly useful. Getting back to my case, what do you think of this? We've said that there's a transverse ulcer, the ileocecal valve looked destroyed. So on the basis of this, I'm thinking this is TB. So just to summarize endoscopic features of TB versus Crohn's disease, ulcers, TB, transverse versus longitudinal, nodular surrounding mucosa versus cobblestone, skip lesions and mucosal bridges. The IC valve is destroyed, fixed or patulous and often preserved in Crohn's disease. And it's more common to involve the rectum in Crohn's disease. I've got a, I'm on video. Okay, imaging. CT features of ITV and Crohn's disease. Um, in general, intestinal TV versus Crohn's disease, you're looking at large abdominal nodes, necrotic nodes, ascites, and short segmental involvement. But I have said previously that you can have multi-segment involvement. Crohn's disease, fat creep or the fibro, fatty proliferation of the mesentery, the comb sign, which shows the hypervascular mesentery, uh, a longer segmental involvement, and symmetrical mural thickening with stratification. And just to show you some, some pictures, this is a portal venous CT scan demonstrating thickening and enhancement in the cecum with a more than one centimeter lymph node. This is thickening in the terminal ileum, and this patient actually not, this isn't the patient I presented, but this patient turned out to have tuberculosis. This is a nice example of an intra-abdominal necrotic lymph node, which would be more in keeping with tuberculosis. This is a very nice coronal CT showing the comb sign or the engorged mesenteric vascularity in a patient with Crohn's disease. This is a, scope, a scan showing thickened hyper-enhancing uh, cecum and terminal ileum and possibly a node here. This was in a patient with TB, but I couldn't tell the difference myself. This is an MRI, the T1 fat set with contrast. T1, the, the, uh, the, the fluid is black and you can see the contrast or post gadolinium enhancing ileocecal lesion. Um, this is a T2 showing there's something going on in the same patient. T2 fluid is white. And this is a T1 showing inflammation and thickening in that area of a patient with tuberculosis and a similar scan. And then we come down to microbiology because ultimately this is what it often comes down to. 
The problem is TB is a submucosal disease and the diagnostic tests unfortunately have a low sensitivity. The zeal Nielsen stain has a, anywhere between three and 40% uh, sensitivity in the, in the paper that I've chatted about with the patients with uh, intestinal TB and non k setting granulomas. The ZN stain was positive in 61%, which means that almost 40% of patients were negative. k 18 granulomas are not commonly seen in patients with TB. Very nice if you can see them. The TB culture can be anywhere between 20 to 60%. It takes long and often we have to wait for this. In the paper that, we pub that was published in SMJ, 52% of confirmed um, TB patients with TB culture positive. And the gene expert is quick. It's easy to do. Its role in a TB and endemic country is, is difficult to, to, uh, to rely on gene expert, but we, we do. And what about histology? We, this is a large TB granuloma, a much smaller uh, granuloma seen in Crohn's disease, and some confluent granulomas with necrosis. This is a, a granuloma on high power. This is what non-acid fast, uh, uh, something stand with ZN, where you don't see acid fast bacilli. And often we have to make do with only one or two little, little uh, bacilli that we see. We're very thrilled when we see this because it confirms the diagnosis. So just to summarize the, the histological uh, features that may differentiate between the two, you tend to see a larger number of granulomas intestinal TB. They tend to be bigger. They can be confluent or, or caseating, but not often. And uh, in Crohn's disease, they tend to be smaller. They microgranulomas. They're not confluent, and there's no caseating necrosis. And although um, granulomas are in fact epithelial histiocytes on, or conglomerate. Uh, <laughs> If epithelial histocytes forming the granulomas, they tend to be much more common in intestinal TB and unusual in Crohn's disease. What about a trial of TB treatment? We occasionally have to resort to this where we're not sure. Eight to 12 week course is not unreasonable and there is some support in guidelines. You can monitor the symptoms, the weight, the hemoglobin and inflammatory markers and see if the patient is getting better. But you would like endoscopic and histologic confirmation of, of healing on the post-treatment colonoscopy. And sometimes we have to cut out that piece if it's a small segment uh, and if it's indicated in the patient for other reasons. So can one differentiate ITB from Crohn's disease on what I've showed you? I think clinically there are some markers, but they by no means definitive. Serologically, there's not much. Endoscopically, there has been um, some studies to suggest you can tell the difference between Crohn's and TB with longitudinal versus transverse. I haven't found it particularly helpful, but that may mean that I'm just average. Imaging certainly could be helpful in some cases where there's necrotic nodes and there's ascites, and obviously histology slash microbiology is the gold standard. But as I've showed you, often it isn't the answer either. So I think a lot depends on your local prevalence data and where you live. Do you have a higher endemic TB problem? Do you have a lot of HIV? And what your IBD prevalence is? We have both, which is uh, problematic for us. But ultimately, it comes down to a probability game, like a lot of medicine. And in fact, some people have looked at this. And in this publication from a couple, uh, a few years ago, a thousand PubMed articles were looked at and, and 33 studies were analyzed. And this crowd came up with 50 clinical predictive values to differentiate between ITB and Crohn's, the clinical manifestations, pathological findings, CT findings, endoscopic findings, and you plug it into this and you come up with a probability that you've got one or the other. Uh, diagnostic accuracy of 91.8%. If you're interested, this is the, the article and you can give it a try. I must say, I don't use this, but it might be very good. So to end, this was an interesting fellow called Joseph Walsh, who was a physician who lived between 1870 and 1946, who was uh, called a tuberculosis, the foe of tuberculosis, and wrote a lot about it. He said it's impossible to diagnose abdominal TB with any degree of, of certainty. 
since the disease mimics many other abdominal conditions and histological conformation may be equivocal. And this was published in 1909 in the transactions of uh, the National Association of Preventive, Preventing Tuberculosis. And I don't think much has changed in a hundred years. And interestingly enough, and he, when, his obituary, uh, when he died, his obituary was published in the New York Times in 1946. Thanks for your attention and I hope you've learned something. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Levin. Really appreciate that talk. We might take one or two super duper short questions in the interests of time. Um, one question was asked by, by panelists as to how often you see both diseases in a patient and then how do you go about deciding which one you're going to pay attention to? Can you give yourself cover while you do the treatment for the other condition? Well, we don't see, I mean, we, we, don't, we, we don't see it both in the same patient. I mean, we either see it as a diagnosis before or we see 4% in our data have pick up TB after. I haven't seen a patient with Crohn's and TB in the same patient. I don't know the answer to that, but certainly I would treat TB because the treatment of Crohn's, the rifampicin in Crohn's might, uh, the, the antibacterial um, action of rifampicin might help a bit in Crohn's, but certainly high dose, high dose steroids is not going to help your patient with uh, intestinal TB. Absolutely. Uh, there was uh, another question, sorry, about yeah. stool culture. I don't think there's any value in TB culture of the stool. First of all, you can't tell if it's non mycobacteria TB, and I don't think it tells you if there's active tuberculosis, latent tuberculosis. So we don't use it. And I don't think it's of any value. There's a question here. Is, are there differences between HIV positive and negative intestinal TB patterns? For example, the Zeal Nielsen, Zeal Nielsen is it more useful in HIV positive patients? Um, I think that in patients, you mean, uh, I think that in patients who have TB and who are HIV positive, you probably in that in that publication in the South African Medical Journal where they looked at patients with ITB with granulomas and Crohn's, the, the portion of patients who had TB, the patients with, with granulomas had a high CD4 count. So in fact, I think that probably patients who had advanced HIV, you may not pick up um, granulomas. And then you would have to stain the granulomas with the, with the Zeal Nielsen stain, and that's where they see the AFBs. I don't know if that answers the question. Um, does it answer the question? As best as probably can be answered. In yeah. This field. Well, yeah. thank you very much for your time and your talk. And I'd like to join Professor Assenberg or Dr. Assenberg with uh thank you together we can thank all the speakers i'm sorry it's 12 41 a.m for me so thank you all and Thanks. uh see you next time